They say that all the world's a stage, but now our stages and our doors are shut. Ghosts in actors' places take their silent bows as if the earthly script has reached full stop, and intervalent episodes of fear now threat the livelihoods of all the players, actors and audiences alike. But find yourself, I pray you now, indulge me if you so desire, and take part here in our playing. Find yourself a breath of laughter, breath of wit, breath of love, and relish in this forgotten act of gathering. For while we cannot meet, and when we can, is slowly shrinking over the horizon, Zoom shall be our gold proscenium, and these, our glowing screens, are only spotlights. We hope these playful visions now do please, but if the atmosphere is found lacking, or else the mix of accents is not catching, or God forbear, our talent sends you packing, this we all just blame on the Wi-Fi lagging. But truly, we hope you find this play well fit, and all the couplets land, just as you like it. As I remember, Adam, it was upon this fashion bequeathed me by will but poor a thousand crowns, and, as thou sayest, charged my brother on his blessing to breed me well. And there begins my sadness. My brother Jacques he keeps at school, and report speaks goldenly of his profit. For my part, he keeps me rustically at home, or, to speak more properly, keeps me here at home unkept. For call you that keeping, for a gentleman of my birth that differs not from the stalling of an ox? His horses are bred better, for besides that they are fair with their feeding, they are taught their manage, and to that end, riders dearly hired. But I, his brother, gain nothing under him but growth, for the which his animals on his dunghills are as much bound to him as I. Besides this nothing that he so plentifully gives me, the something that nature gave me, his countenance seems to take from me. He lets me feed with his hinds, bars me the place of a brother, and, as much as in him lies, minds my gentility with my education. This is it, Adam, that grieves me. And the spirit of my father, which I think is within me, begins to mutiny against this servitude. I will no longer endure it, though yet I know no wise remedy how to avoid it. Yonder comes my master, your brother. Thou shalt hear how he will shake me up. Now, sir, what make you here? Nothing. I'm not taught to make anything. What mar you then, sir? Marry, sir. I'm helping you to mar that which God made, a poor unworthy brother of yours, with idleness. Marry, sir, be better employed and be not a while. Shall I keep your hogs and eat husks with them too? What prodigal portion have I spent that I should come to such penury? Know you where you are, sir? Oh, sir, very well. Here in your orchard. Know you before whom, sir? I, better than him I am before knows me. I know you are my eldest brother, and in the gentle condition of blood, you should so know me. I have as much of my father in me as you, albeit I confess your coming before me is nearer to his reverence. What boy? Come, come, elder brother, you are too young in this. Will thou taunt me? Villain? I am no villain. I'm the youngest son of Sir Roland de Bois. He was my father, and he is thrice a villain that says such a father begot villains. Wert thou not my brother? I would not take this hand from thy throat till this other had pulled out thy tongue for saying so. Thou hast railed thyself. Sweet masters, be patient, for your father's remembrance be it accord. I will not go till I please. You shall hear me. My father charged you in his will to give me good education. You have trained me like a peasant, obscuring and hiding from me all gentlemanlike qualities. The spirit of my father grows strong in me, and I will no longer endure it. Therefore, allow me such exercises as may become a gentleman, or give me the poor lottery my father left me by testament. With that, I will go buy my fortunes. And what wilt thou do? Beg when that is spent? Well, sir, get you in. I will not long be troubled with you. You shall have some part of your will. Pray you leave me. I will no further offend you than becomes me for my good. Get you with him, you old dog. Is old dog my reward? Most true, I have lost my teeth in your service. God be with my old master. He would never have spoke such a word. 
Is it even so? Begin you to grow upon me? I will physique your rightness and yet give you no thousand crowns neither. Taller, Dennis. Calls your worship. Was not Charles the Duke wrestler here to speak with me? So please you, he is here at the door and importunes access to you. Call him in. Should be a good way. And tomorrow the wrestling is. <clears throat> good morrow to your worship. Good, Monsieur Charles. What's the new news at the new court? There is no news at court, sir, but the old news. That is, the old duke is banished by his younger brother, the new duke, and three or four loving lords have put themselves into voluntary exile with him, whose lands and revenues enrich the new duke, therefore he gives them leave to wander. Can you tell if Rosalind, the duke's daughter, be banished with her father? Oh, no. For the duke's daughter, her cousin, so loves her, being ever from their cradles bred together, that she would have followed her exile or have died to stay behind her. She is at the court, and never two ladies loved as they do. Where will the old duke live? They say he is already in the forest of Arden, and many a merry men with him. And there they live like the old Robin Hood of England. They say many young gentlemen flock to him every day, and fleet the time carelessly as they did in the golden world. What? You wrestled tomorrow before the new duke? Marry do I, sir. And I came to acquaint you with a matter. I am given, sir, secretly, secretly to understand that your younger brother Orlando hath a disposition to come in disguised against me to try a fall. Tomorrow, sir, I wrestle for my credit, and he that escapes me without some broken limb shall acquit him well. Your brother is but young and tender, and out of my love to you I came hither to acquaint you with all, that you might stay him from his intendment. Charles, I thank thee for thy love to me. I had myself notice of my brother's purpose herein, and have by underhand means labored to dissuade him from it. But he's resolute. I tell thee, Charles, it is the stubbornest young fellow of France, full of ambition, an envious emulator of every man's good parts, a secret and villainous contriver against me, his natural brother. Therefore, use thy discretion. I had as lief thou didst break his neck as his finger. For I assure thee, and it is almost with tears I speak it, there is not one so young and so villainous this day living. I am heartily glad I came hither to you. If he come tomorrow, I shall give him his payment. If ever he go alone again, I'll never wrestle for prize more. And so God keep your worship. Farewell, good Charles. Now I will stir this gamester. I hope to see an end to him, because my soul, yet I know not why, hates nothing more than he. Yet he's gentle, never schooled, and yet learned, full of noble device, of all sorts, enchantingly beloved, and so much, indeed, in the heart of this world, especially by my own people, who know him best, that I'm altogether misprized. It shall not be long. This wrestler shall clear all. Nothing remains but that I kindle the boy thither, which now I shall go about. I pray thee, Rosalind, sweet my cuz, be merry. You see, dear, I show more mirth than I am mistress of. And would you yet were merrier? Unless you could teach me how to forget a banished father, you must not learn me how to remember any extraordinary pleasure. <laughs> Herein I see thou lovest me not with the full weight that I love thee. If my uncle, the duke, thy father, had banished thy uncle, the duke, my father, so hadst thou been still with me, I could have taught my love to take thy father from mine. So wouldst thou, if the truth of thy love to me were so righteously tempered as mine is to thee. Well, I will forget the condition of my estate to rejoice in yours. 
You know my father hath no child but I, nor none is like to have. And truly, when he dies, thou shalt be his heir. For what he hath taken from thy father perforce, I will render thee again in affection. By mine honor I will, and when I break this oath, let me turn monster. Therefore, my sweet Rose, my dear Rose, be merry. From henceforth I will cuss and devise sports. Let me see. What think you of falling in love? Mm, Mary, I prithee do, to make sport withal. But love no man in good earnest, nor no further in sport, neither than with safety of a pure blush thou mayest in honour come off again. What shall be our sport then? Let us sit and mock the good housewife, fortune from her wheel, that her gifts may henceforth be bestowed equally. I would we could do so. Her benefits are mightily misplaced, and the mm. bountiful blind woman doth most mistake in her gifts to women. Mm -hmm. On our wit, whither one do you? Oh. You're mute. I can't hear you. <laughs> you have to push the button. Mistress, mistress, is that, can you hear yeah. me? Yeah, okay, mistress, you must away to your father. <laughs> Were you made the messenger? Uh, no, no, <laughs> by mine honour. <laughs> but I was bid come for you. Well, and you that oathful? Of a certain knight who swore by his honour that the pancakes were good, and swore by his honour that the mustard was not. Now I'll stand to it. The pancakes were not, and the mustard was good, and yet was not the knight forsworn. How prove you that in the great heap of your knowledge? Ay, marry, now and muzzle your wisdom. Stand you both forth. Stroke your chins and swear by your beards that I am a knave. By our beards, if we had them, thou art. By my knavery, if I had it, then I were. But if you swear by that that is not, you are not forsworn. No more was this knight swearing by his honour, for he never had any, or if he had, he had sworn it away long before ever he saw those pancakes or that mustard. Uh, prithee, who is that thou meanst? Ah, that one old Ferdinand your father loved. My father's love is enough to honour him. Speak no more. You'll be whipped for taxation one of these days. Ooh, the more pity that fools may not speak wisely what wise men do foolishly. By my troth, thou sayest true. For since the little wit that fools have was silenced, the little foolery that wise men have makes a great show. Oh, here comes Monsieur Lebeau. Fair princess, you have lost much good sport. Sport? Of what color? What color, madame? How shall I answer you? As wit and fortune will. Or as the destiny's decree. <laughs> well said. That was laid on with a trowel. <laughs> Nay, if I keep not my rank. Thou losest thy old smell. You amaze me, ladies. I would have told you of good wrestling, which you have lost the sight of. Yet tell us the matter of the wrestling. I will tell you the beginning, and if it please you, ladyships, you may see the end. For the best is yet to do. And here, where you are, they are coming to perform it. There comes an old man that his three sons, three proper young men with excellent growth and <laughs> presence. The eldest of the three wrestled with Charles, the Duke's wrestler, which Charles in a moment threw him and broke three of his ribs. That there is little hope of life in him. So he served the second and so the third. Yonder they lie, the poor old man, their father, making such pitiful dole over them. All the beholders take his part with weeping. Alas. What, monsieur, is the sport that the ladies have lost? Why, this that I speak of. <laughs> Thus men may grow wiser every day. This is the first that ever I heard. The breaking of ribs was sport for ladies. Or I, I promise thee. But does any else longs to hear this broken music in his sides? Is there yet another that dotes upon rib breaking? Shall we see this wrestling, cousin? You must if you stay here, for here is the place appointed for the wrestling, and they are ready to perform it. Yonder, sure, they are coming. Let us now stay and see it. Is yonder the man? Even he, madame. Alas, he is too young. Yet he looks successfully. <laughs> How now, daughter and cousin? Yeah. Are you crept hither to see the wrestling? Aye, my liege, so please you give us leave. You will take little delight in it, I can tell you. There is such odds in the man. In pity of the challenger's youth, I would fain dissuade him, but he will not be entreated. 
Speak to him, ladies. See if you can move him. Call him hither, good Monsieur Lebeau. Monsieur the Challenger, the princesses call for you. I attend them with all respect and duty. Uh, young man, have you challenged Charles the Wrestler? No. Fair princess, <clears throat> he is the general challenger. I come but in, as others do, to try him with the strength of my youth. Young gentleman, your spirits are too bold for your years. We pray you, for your own sake, to embrace your own safety and give over this attempt. Do, young sir. Your reputation shall not be misprized. We will make it our suit to the Duke that the wrestling might not go forward. I beseech you, punish me not with your hard thoughts, wherein I confess me much guilty to deny so fair and excellent ladies anything. But let your fair eyes and gentle wishes go with me to my trial. Wherein, if I be foiled, there is but one shamed who is never gracious. If killed, but one dead that was willing to be so. I shall do my friends no wrong, for I have none to lament me. The world no injury, for in it I have nothing. Only in the world I fill up a place, which may be better supplied when I have made it empty. <laughs> strength I have, I would it well with you. And mine, to weak out hers. Fare you well. I heaven I be deceived in you. Your heart's desires be with you. Come, where is this young gallant that is so desirous to lie with his mother earth? Ready, sir, but his will hath in it a more modest working. You shall try but one fall. Ha! No, I warrant your grace. You shall not entreat him to a second that have so mightily persuaded him from a first. <laughs> and you mean to mock me after? You should not have mocked me before. But come your ways. No more, no more, no more. Yes, I beseech your grace, I am not yet well breathed. How dost thou, Charles? He cannot speak, my lord. Bear him away. What is thy name, young man? Orlando, my liege, the youngest son of Sir Roland de Bois. I would thou hast been son to some man else. The world esteemed thy father honorable, but I did find him still mine enemy. Thou shouldst have better pleased me with this deed, hath thou descended from another house. But fare thee well, thou art a gallant youth. How would thou hast told me of another father? I am more proud to be Sir Roland's son, his youngest son, and would not change that calling to be adopted heir to Frederick. Gentle cousin, let us go thank him and encourage him. My father's rough and envious disposition sticks me at heart. <clears throat> Sir, you have well deserved, if you do keep your promises in love, but justly, as you have exceeded all promise, your mistress shall be happy. Gentlemen, wear this for me. One of the suits with fortune that would give more but that her hands lack means. <clears throat> shall we go, cuz? Aye. Fare you well, fair gentlemen. Now, not say I thank you. My better parts are all thrown down, and that which here stands up is but a quintain, a mere lifeless block. He calls us back. My pride travelled with my fortune. I'll ask him what he would. Did you call us, sir? Uh, you have wrestled well, and overthrown more than your enemies. <laughs> Oh, will you go, cuz? You. Fare you well. What passion hangs these weights upon my tongue? I cannot speak to her, yet she urged conference. Oh, poor Orlando, thou art overthrown, or Charles or something weaker masters thee. Good sir, I do in friendship counsel you to leave this place. Albeit you have deserved high commendation, true applause, and love. Yet, 
such as now the Duke's condition that he misconstrues all that you have done. Thank you, sir. And <clears throat> pray you, tell me this. Which of the two was daughter of the Duke that here was at the wrestling? Neither his daughter if we judge by manners, but yet indeed the lesser is his daughter, and the other is daughter to the banished Duke. And here detained by her usurping uncle to keep his daughter company, whose loves are dearer than the true bond of sisters. But I can tell you that of late, this Duke hath taken displeasure against his gentle niece, grounded upon no other argument, but that the people praise her for her virtues and pity her for her good father's sake. And on my life, his malinscates, the lady will suddenly break forth. Sir, fare you well. Hereafter, in a better world than this, I shall desire more love and knowledge of you. I rest much bound into you. Fare you well. Thus must I from the smoke into the smother, from a tyrant duke unto a tyrant brother. <sighs> but heavenly Rosalind. <laughs> Rosalind, Cupid, have mercy, not a word. Not one to throw at a dog. But is all this for your father? No, some of it is for my child's father. Oh, how full of bread is this working day world. <laughs> they are but burrs, cousin, thrown upon thee in holiday foolery. If we walk not in the trodden paths, our very petticoats will catch them. I could shake them off my coat. These burrs are in my heart. Hem them away. I would try if I could cry hem and have him. <laughs> come, come, wrestle with thy affections. Oh, they take the part of a better wrestler than myself. Is it possible? <laughs> On such a sudden that you should fall into so strong a liking with old Sir Roland's youngest son? The Duke, my father, loved his father dearly. <laughs> Doth it therefore ensue that you should love his son dearly? By this kind of chase, I should hate him, for my father hated his father dearly, yet I hate not Orlando. Look, here comes the Duke. With eyes full of anger. Mistress, dispatch you with your safest haste and get you from our court. Me, uncle. You, cousin. Within these ten days, if that thou beest found so near our public court as twenty miles, thou diest for it. I do beseech your grace, let me the knowledge of my faults bear with me. If with myself I hold intelligence or have acquaintance with mine own desires, if that I do not dream or be not frantic as I do trust, I am not then. Dear uncle, never so much as in a thought unborn did I offend your highness. Thus do all traitors. If their purgation did consist in words, they are as innocent as grace itself. Let it suffice that I trust thee not. Yet your mistrust cannot make me a traitor. Tell me where on the likelihood depends. Thou art thy father's daughter, there's enough. So was I when your highness spanished him. So was I when your highness took his dukedom. Treason is not inherited, my lord. Or, if we did derive it from our friends, what's that to me? My father was no traitor. Then, good, my liege, mistake me not so much to think my poverty is treacherous. Dear sovereign, hear me speak. Aye, Celia, we stayed her for your sake. Else had she with her father ranged along. I did not then entreat to have her stay. It was your pleasure and your own remorse. I was too young that time to value her, but now I know her. If she be a traitor, why, so am I. We still had slept together, rose at an instant, learned, played, et together, and wheresoever we went, like Juno swans, still we went coupled and inseparable. She is too subtle for thee, and her smoothness, her very silence, and her patience speak to the people, and they pity her. Thou art a fool. She robs thee of thy name, and thou wilt show more bright and seem more virtuous when she is gone. Then open not thy lips, firm and irrevocable is my doom, which I have passed upon her. She is banished. Pronounce that sentence then on me, my liege. I cannot live out of her company. You are a fool. You, niece, 
provide yourself. If you outstay the time upon my honor and in the greatness of my word, you die. Oh, my poor Rosalind, whither wilt thou go? Wilt thou change fathers? I will give thee mine. I charge thee, be not thou more grieved than I am. Shall we be sundered? Shall we part, sweet girl? No, let my father seek another heir. Therefore devise with me how we may fly, whither to go and what to bear with us. And do not seek to take your change upon you, to bear your griefs yourself and leave me out. For by this heaven, now at our sorrows pale, say what thou canst, I'll go along with thee. Why, whither shall we go? To seek my uncle in the forest of Arden. Alas, what danger will it be to us, maids as we are, to travel forth so far? Beauty provoketh thieves sooner than gold. I'll put myself in poor and mean attire, and with a kind of umber smirch my face. The like do you, so shall we pass along and never stir assailants. Were it not better that I did suit me all points like a man? <laughs> a gallant kirtle axe upon my thigh, a boar spear in my hand, and in my heart lie there what hidden woman's fear there will. I'll have a very swashing and a martial outside, as many <laughs> other mannish cowards have that do outface it with their semblances. What shall I call thee, when thou art a man? I'll have no worse name than Jove's own page. Therefore, look, you call me Ganymede. <laughs> but what will you be called? <laughs> well, something that hath a reference to my state. No longer Celia, but Aliena. <laughs> but cousin, what if we essay to steal the clownish fool out of your father's court? <laughs> Would he not be a comfort to our travel? Oh, he'll go along o'er the wide world with me. Leave me alone to woo him. That's a way. Devise the fittest time and safest way to hide us from pursuit that will be made after my flight. Now, go we in content to liberty and not to banishment. Now, my co-mates and brothers in exile, hath that old custom made this life more sweet than that of painted pomp? Are not these woods more free from peril than the envious court? Here feel we but the penalty of Adam, the season's difference as the icy fang and churlish chiding of the winter's wind, which when it bites and blows upon my body, even till I shrink with cold, I smile and say, this is no flattery. These are counselors that feelingly persuade me what I am. Sweet are the uses of adversity, which, like the toad, ugly and venomous, wears yet a precious jewel in his head. And this, our life, exempt from public haunt, finds tongues in trees, books in the running brooks, sermons in stones, and good in everything. I would not change it. Happy is your grace that could translate the stubbornness of fortune into so quiet and so sweet a style. Come, shall we go and kill us venison? And yet it irks me. The poor dappled fools being native burghers of this desert city should in their own confines with forked heads have their round haunches gored. Oh, indeed, my lord. The melancholy Jaques grieves at that. Today, my lord of Amiens and myself did steal behind him as he lay along under the oak whose antique root peeps out upon the brook that brawls along this wood. There he found a poor sequestered stag whose from the hunter's aim had taken a hurt did come to languish there. Thus this hairy fool, much marked by the melancholy Jaques, did stand on the extremest verge of the swift brook, augmenting it with tears. But what said Jakes? Did he not moralize the spectacle? Oh, I, in a thousand similes. First, for his uh, weeping into the needless stream, poor dear, quoth he, thou makest a testament as worldlings do to give thy sum of more to that which had too much. Then, being there alone, left and abandoned of his velvet friend, tis right, quoth Jakes, 
misery doth part the flux of company. Anon, a careless herd, full of pasture, jumps along and never stays to greet him. I, quoth he, sweep on, you fat and greasy citizens, tis just the fashion. Wherefore do you look upon the poor and broken bankrupt there? Thus invectively he pierces through the country, the city, the court, I and of this our life, swearing that we were mere uh, usurpers and tyrants, and what's worse, to fright up the animals and to kill them in their assigned and native dwelling place. And did you leave him in this contemplation? Yes, my lord, we did, weeping and commenting on the sobbing deer. Show me the place. I love to cope him in these sullen fits, for then he's full of matter. I'll lead you to him straight. Can it be possible that no man saw them? It cannot be. Some villains of my court have consent and sufferance in this. I cannot hear of any that did see her. The ladies, her attendants of her chamber, saw her abed, and in the morning early they found the bed untreasured of their mistress. My lord, the ruinous clown at whom so oft your grace was wont to laugh is also missing. Hesperia, the princess's gentlewoman, confesses that she secretly overheard your daughter and her cousin much commend the parts and graces of the wrestler that did but lately foil this sinewy Charles, and she believes that wherever they are gone, that youth is surely in their company. Send to his brother. Fetch that gallant hither. If he be absent, bring his brother to me. I'll make him find him. Do this suddenly, and let not search and inquisition quail to bring again these foolish runaways. Who's there? What? My young master. Oh, my sweet master. Oh, my gentle master. Oh, you memory of old Sir Roland, what make you here? Why are you virtuous? Why do people love you? And wherefore are you so fond to overcome the bonny wrestler of the venomous duke? Why? What's the matter? Oh, unhappy youth, come not within these doors. Within this roof, the enemy of all your graces lives. Your brother hath heard your praises, and this night he means to burn the lodging where you used to lie, and you within it. Should he fail at that, he hath other means to cut you off. I overheard him in his practices. This is no place. This house is but a butchery. Abhor it, fear it, do not enter it. Why, whither, Adam, wouldst thou have me go? No matter whither, so you come not here. What, wouldst thou have me go and beg my food? Or with a base and boisterous sword enforce a thievish living on the common road? This I must do, or know not what to do. Yet this I will not do, do how I can. I rather will subject me to the malice of a diverted blood and bloody brother. But do not so. I have five hundred crowns, a thrifty hire I saved under your father, which I did store to be my foster nurse, when service should in my old limbs lie lame and in unregarded age in corners thrown. Take that. And he that doth the ravens feed, yea, who providently caters to the sparrow, be comfort to my age. Let me be your servant. Though I look old, yet I am strong and lusty, for in my youth I never did apply rebellious liquors to my blood. Therefore my age is as a lusty winter, frosty but kindly. Let me go with you. I'll do the service of a younger man in all your business and necessities. Oh, good old man, how well in thee appears the constant service of the antique world, when service sweat for duty, not for mead. Thou art not for the fashion of these times, but come thy ways. We'll go along together, and ere we have thy youthful wages spent, we'll light upon some settled low content. Master, go on, and I will follow thee to the last gasp with truth and loyalty. Oh, Jupiter, how weary are my spirits. Oh, I care not for my spirits if my legs were not weary. I can find in my heart to disgrace my man's apparel and cry like a woman. 
I pray you, bear with me. I cannot go no further. Oh, God. <laughs> For my part, I had rather bear with you than bear you. <laughs> Yet I should bear no cross if I did bear with you, for I think you have no money in your purse. Well, this is the Forest of Arden. Oh, now am I in Arden? The more fool I. Ugh, when I was at home, I was in a better place. But travellers must be content. Aye, be so good, Touchstone. Thank you, who comes here? That is the way to make her scorn you still. Oh, uh, Corin, that thou knewest how I do love her. I partly guess, for I have loved ere now. No, Corin, being old thou canst not guess, though in thy youth thou wast as true a lover as ever sighed upon a midnight pillow. But if thy love were ever like to mine, as sure I think did never man love so, how many actions most ridiculous hast thou been drawn to by thy fantasy? It's to a thousand that I have forgotten. Oh, thou didst then ne'er love so heartily. If thou rememberst not the slightest folly that ever love did make thee run into, thou hast not loved. Or if thou hast not sat, as I do now, wearying thy hearer in thy mistress's praise, thou hast not loved. Or if thou hast not broke from company abruptly, as my passion now makes me, thou hast not loved. Oh, baby, baby. Oh, alas, poor shepherd. Searching for thy wound, I have by hard adventure found mine own. I pray you, what have you questioned yon man if he will forgo and give us any food? I faint almost to death. Oh, you clown! Peace, fool! He's not my kinsman. Who calls? Your betters, sir. Else are they very wretched. Peace, I say. Good even to you, friend. And to you, gentle sir, and to you all. <laughs> I prithee, shepherd, if that love or gold can in this desert place by entertainment bring us where we may rest ourselves and feed. Here's a young maid with travel much oppressed and faints for succour. Faith, sir, I pity her and wish for her sake more than for my own my fortunes were more able to relieve her but I am shepherd to another man and do not share the fleece that I graze. My master is of churlish disposition and little wrecks to find the way to heaven by doing deeds of hospitality. Besides his coat, his flock and bounds of feet are on sale now. And at our sheep goat now, by reasons of his absence, there is nothing you will feed on. But what is, come see and in my voice most welcome shall you be. Uh, what is he that shall buy his flock and pasture? That young swain you saw here, but erewhile, that little cares for buying anything. I pray thee, if it stand with honesty, buy thou the cottage, pasture, and the flock, and thou shalt have to pay for it of us. And we will mend thy wages. I like this place, and willingly could waste my time in it. Assuredly, the thing is to be sold. Go with me, if you like, upon report. The soil, the profit, and this kind of life, I will your very faithful fee to be, and buy it with your gold right suddenly. <laughs> Under the greenwood tree, who loves to lie with me, and turns his merry nose. Under the sweet bird's throat, Come hither, come hither, come hither, here shall he see no enemy but winter and rough weather. More, more, I pray thee more. It will make you melancholy, Monsieur J, please. And I thank it. More, I prithee more. I can suck melancholy out of a song as a weasel sucks eggs. More, I prithee more. My voice is ragged. I know I cannot please you. I do not desire you to please me. I do desire you to sing. Come, another stanzo. Call you stanzos. What you will, Monsieur J, please. Nay. 
I care not for their name. They owe me nothing. Will you sing? More at your request than to please myself. Well, if ever I thank any man, I'll thank you. Come, sing, and you that will not, hold your tongue. Well, all in the song. Sirs, cover the while. The Duke will drink under this tree. He hath all this day to look you. And I have been all this day to avoid him. He's too disputable of my company. I think of as many matters as he, but I give heaven thanks. Make no boast of them. Come, Warble, come. Who doth ambition shun and loves to live in the sun, seeking the food he eats and pleased with what he gets. Come hither, come hither, come hither, here shall he see. I'll give you a verse to this note that I wrote yesterday, in spite of my invention. And I'll sing it. Thus it goes. If it do come to pass that any man turn ass, leaving his wealth and ease a stubborn will to please, duc dame, duc dame, duc dame, here shall he see gross fools as he, and if he will come to me. What's that, Dukdame? It is a Greek invocation to call fools out of isolation. Hmm. I'll go sleep if I can. If I cannot, I'll rail against the firstborn of Egypt. And I'll go see the Duke. His banquet is prepared. Dear Master, I can go no further. Here lie I down and measure out my grave. Farewell, kind master. Why, how now, Adam? No greater heart in thee? Live a little, comfort a little, cheer thyself a little. If this uncouth forest yield anything savage, I will either be food for it or bring it as food to thee, and thou shalt not die for lack of a dinner. If there live anything in this desert, cheerly, good Adam. I think he'd be transformed into a beast where I can nowhere find him like a man. My lord, he's but even now gone hence. Here was he merry, hearing of song. Go, seek him. Tell him I would speak with him. He saves my labor by his own approach. Why, how now, monsieur? What a life is this that your poor friends must woo your company? What, look you merrily. A fool. A fool. I met a fool in the forest. A motley fool, a miserable world, as I do live by food, I met a fool of the forest. Good morrow, fool, quoth I. Nay, sir, quoth he, call me not fool till heaven hath sent me fortune. And then he drew a dial from his poke, and looking on it with lackluster eyes, says very wisely, It is ten o'clock. Thus we may see, quoth he, how the world wags. Tis but an hour ago it was nine, and in one hour more it will be eleven. And so, from hour to hour we ripe and ripe, and then from hour to hour we rot and rot, and thereby hangs a tale. <laughs> when I did see the motley fool thus moral on the time, my lungs began to crawl like Chanticleer that fools should be so deep contemplative. <laughs> and I did laugh sans intermission an hour by his dial. Oh, Noble fool, a worthy fool. Motley's the only wear. <laughs> what fool is this? A worthy fool, one that hath been a courtier and says, if ladies be but young and fair, they have the gift to know it. <laughs> oh, that I were a fool. I am ambitious for a motley coat. Thou shalt have one. It is my only suit. Provided that you weed your better judgment of all opinion that goes rank in them, that I am wise. 
I must have liberty withal, as large a charter as the wind, to blow on whom I please. For so fools have, and he that is most galled with my folly, why, he most must laugh. And why must he so? The white is plain as way to parish church. He that the fool doth very wisely hit, doth very foolishly, although he's smart, not to seem senseless of the bob. If not, the wise man's folly is anatomized, even by the squandering glances of the fool. Most mischievous thou sin and chiding sin, for thou thyself hast been a libertine, as sensual as the brutish sting itself, and all the embossed sores and headed evils that thou, with license of free foot, hast caught, wouldst thou disgorge into the general world. Why, who cries out on pride that can therein tax any private party? Doth it not flow as hugely as the sea to the weary very means? Do ebb? Forbear, and eat no more. Well, I have had none yet. Nor shalt not till necessity be served. Are thou thus bold and mad by thy distress, or else a rude despiser of good manners, that in civility thou seem so empty? You touched my vein at first. The thorny point of bare distress hath ta'en from me the show of smooth civility. Yet am I inland bred, and know some nurture. But forbear, I say. He dies that touches any of this fruit, till I and my affairs are answered. What would you have? Your gentleness shall force more than your force move us to gentleness. I almost die for food, and let me have it. Sit down, and feed, and welcome to our table. Speak you so gently? Pardon me, I pray you. I thought that all things had been savage here, and therefore put I on the countenance of stern commandment. But whate'er you are, that in this desert inaccessible, under the shade of melancholy boughs, lose and neglect the creeping hours of time. If ever you have looked on better days, if ever been where bells have knolled to church, if ever sat at any good man's feast, if ever from your eyelids wiped a tear, and know what tis to pity and be pitied, let gentleness my strong enforcement be, and the which hope I blush, and hide my sword. True is it, we have seen better days. And therefore sit you down in gentleness, and take upon command what help we have that your wanting may be ministered. Uh, then, but forbear your food a little while, whilst like a doe I go to find my fawn and give it food. There is an old, poor man, who after me hath many a weary step, limped in pure love. Till he be first sufficed, oppressed with two weak evils, age and hunger, I will not touch a bit. Go, find him out, and we will nothing waste till you return. <laughs> I thank ye, and be blessed for your good comfort. Thou seest, we're not all alone unhappy. This wide and universal theater presents more woeful pageants than the scene wherein we play in. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts. His acts being seven ages. At first, the infant, mewling and puking in the nurse's arms. Then the whining schoolboy with his satchel and his shining morning face, creeping like snail unwillingly to school. And then the lover, sighing like furnace, with a woeful ballad made to his mistress's eyebrow. And then the soldier, full of strange oaths, and bearded like the pard, jealous in honor, sudden, and quick in quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation even in the cannon's mouth. And then the justice, in fair round belly, with good cape and lined, with eyes severe and beard of formal cut, Full of wise saws and modern instances, and so he plays his part. The sixth age shifts into the lean and slippered pantaloon, with spectacles on nose and pouch on side, his youthful hose well saved, a world too wide for his shrunk shank, and his big manly voice turning again towards childish treble, pipes and whistles in his sound. Last scene of all that ends this strange eventful history, second childishness, and mere oblivion. 
sun's teeth, sun's eyes, sun's taste, sun's everything. Welcome. Set down your venerable burthen and let him feed. Give us some music and good cousin, sing. Oh, blow thy winter wind, thou art not so unkind as man's ingratitude. Thy tooth is not so keen, because thou art not seen, although thy breath be rude. Hi-ho, hi-ho, to the green holly, most friendship is feigning, most loving. Hi-ho, me folly, hi-ho, the holly. This life is most jolly. If that you were the good Sir Roland's son, as you have whispered faithfully you were, be truly welcome hither. I am the duke that loved your father, the residue of your fortune. Go to my cave and tell me. Good old man, thou art right welcome as thy master is. Support him by the arm, give me your hand, and let me all your fortunes understand. Not seen him since. Sir, sir, that cannot be. But were I not the better part made mercy, I should not seek an absent argument to my revenge thou present. But look to it. Find out thy brother, wheresoever he is. Seek him with candle. Bring him dead or living within this twelve month, or turn thou no more to seek a living in our territory. Thy lands and all things that thou dost call thine worth seizure do we seize into our hands till thou canst quit thee by thy brother's mouth of what we think against thee. Oh, that thy highness knew my heart in this. I never loved my brother in all my life. More villain thou. Well, push him out of doors and let my officers of such a nature make an extent upon his house and lands. Do this expediently and turn him going. And how like you the shepherd's life, Master Touchstone? Truly, shepherd, in respect of itself, it is a good life, but in respect that it is a shepherd's life, it is not. In respect that it is solitary, I like it very well, but in respect that it is private, it is a very vile life. Now, in respect it is in the fields, it pleases me well, but in respect it is not in the court, it is tedious. As it is a spare life, look you, it, it fits my humor well, but as there is no more plenty in it, ugh, it goes much against my stomach. Hast any philosophy in thee, Shepherd? No more, but that I know the more one sickens, the worse at ease he is, that the property of rain is to wet and fire to burn, that good pasture makes fat sheep, and that a great cause of the night is lack of the sun. Oh, such a one is a natural philosopher. Hast ever been at court? No, truly. Why, well, th then thou art damned. Nay, I hope. Truly, thou art damned like a ill roasted egg all on one side. For not being at court, your reason. Why, if thou never wast at court, thou never sawst good manners. And if thou never sawst good manners, then thy manners must be wicked. And wickedness is sin, and sin is damnation. Thou art in a parlous state, shepherd. Not a wit, Touchstone. Those that are good manners in the court are as ridiculous in the country as the behavior of the country is most mockable at court. You told me you salute not at court, but you kiss your hands. That courtesy would be uncleanly if courtiers were shepherds. Instance, briefly, come, instance. Why, we are still handling our ewes, and their fails, you know, are greasy. Why do not your courtier's hands sweat? And is not the grease of a mutton as wholesome as the sweat of a man? Shallow, shallow. Uh, better instance, I say, come. Besides, our hands are hard. Your lips will feel them the sooner. Shallow again, a more sounder instance. I say, come. 
and they are often tarred over with the surgery of our sheep. And would you have us kiss tar? The courtier's hands are perfumed with civet. No shallow man! Thou worms meat in respect of a good piece of flesh. Indeed, learn of the wise and perpend. Civet is of a baser birth than tar, the very uncleanly flux of a cat. Mend the instant shepherd. You have too courtly a wit for me. I'll rest. Wilt thou rest damned? Oh, God, help thee, shallow man. God make incision in thee. <laughs> thou art raw. Sir, I am a true laborer. I earn that I eat. I get that I wear. Oh, no man hate and be no man's happiness. Glad of other man's good, content with my harm. And the greatest of my pride is to see my ewes graze and my lambs suck. That is another simple sin in you, to bring the ewes and the rams together, and to offer to get your living by the copulation of cattle, to be bawd to a bellwether, and to betray a she-lamb of a twelve month to a crooked-pated old cockledy ram, <laughs> out of all reasonable match? Oh. If thou be not damned for this, the devil himself shall have no shepherds. I cannot see how else thou should scape. Here comes young Master Ganymede, my new mistress, brother. From the east to western end, no jewel is like Rosalind. Her worth being mounted on the wind through all the world beams Rosalind. All the pictures, fairest lined, are but black to Rosalind. Let no fair be kept in mind but the fair of Rosalind. <laughs> Oh, 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 I'll rhyme you so eight years together, dinner and supper and sleeping hours accepted. Out, fool. For a taste. If a heart do lack a hind, let him seek out Rosalind. Winter's garments must be lined, so must slender Rosalind. Sweetest nut have sourest rind, such a nut is Rosalind. He that sweetest rose will find, must find love's prick and Rosaline. <laughs> These are the very false gallops of verse. Why do you infect yourself with them? Peace, you dull fool. I found them on a tree. <laughs> Truly, the tree yields bad fruit. Peace. Oh, here comes my sister. Reading. Stand aside. <laughs> Thus, Rosalind of many parts by heavenly synod was devised of many faces, eyes, and hearts to have the touches dearest prized. Heaven would that she these gifts should have, and I to live and die her slave. Slave. Oh, most gentle pulpiter, what tedious homily of love have you wearied your parishioners with all? How now? <laughs> Go off a little. Go with him, Sarah. Oh, come, Shepherd. Let us make an honorable retreat. <laughs> <laughs> didst thou hear these verses? Oh, yes, and more, too. But didst thou hear them without wondering how thy name should be hanged and carved upon these trees? I was seven of the nine days out of the wonder before you came to look here what I found on a palm tree. <laughs> Tro you who hath done this? Is it a man? And a chain that you once wore about his neck. I Change your colour. I prithee, who? Oh, oh, Lord. Lord, it is a hard matter for friends to meet. But mountains may be removed by earthquakes and so encounter. Nay, but who is it? <sighs> is it possible? Nay, I prithee now with most petitionary vehemence. Tell me who it is. Oh! Wonderful, wonderful, and most wonderful, wonderful, and yet again, wonderful. <laughs> Good my complexion, dost thou think though I'm caprisoned like a man, I have a doublet and hose of my disposition? <laughs> Tell me, who is it, quickly, and speak apace. It is young Orlando that tripped up the wrestler's heels and your heart, both in an instant. Nay, but the devil take mocking. Speak sad brow and true maid. If faith, cuz, tis he. Orlando. Orlando. <laughs> oh, last the day. 
What did I do with my doublet and hose? What did he when thou saw him? What said he? How looks he? Wherein went he? What makes him here? Did he ask for me? Where remains he? How passed he with thee? And when shalt thou see him again? Answer me in one word. You must borrow me Gargantua's mouth first. Tis a word too great for any mouth of this age's size. But doth he know that I'm in the forest and in man's apparel? Looks he as freshly as he did the day he wrestled. It is as easy to count atomies as to resolve the propositions of a lover, but take a taste of my finding him and relish it with good observance. I found him under a tree like a dropped acorn. It may well be called Jove's tree when it drops forth such fruit. <clears throat> Give me audience, good madam. Proceed. There lay he, stretched along like a wounded knight. Oh, but be pity to see such a sight, it well becomes the ground. <gasps> I prithee, cry holla to thy tongue. It curvets unseasonably. He was furnished like a hunter. <laughs> oh, ominous. He comes to kill my heart. I would sing my song without a burden. Thou bringest me out of tune. You don't know I am a human. When I think I must speak. Sweet, say on. You bring me out. Soft, comes he not here? Tis he, slink by and note him. I thank you for your company, but good faith, I had as lief been myself alone. And so had I. But yet, for fashion's sake, I thank you too for your society. God be with you. Let's meet as little as we can. I do desire we may be better strangers. I pray you, mar no more of our trees with writing love songs in their barks. I pray you, mar no more of my verses by reading them ill-favouredly. Rosalind is your love's name? Yes, just. I do not like her name. There is no thought of pleasing you when she was christened. You have a nimble wit. Will you sit down with me? <laughs> And we too will rail against our mistress, the world, and all our misery. I will try no breather in the world but myself, against whom I know most faults. The worst fault you have is to be in love. Tis a fault I will not change for your best virtue. I am weary of you. By my troth, I was seeking a fool when I found you. He is drowned in the brook. Look but in, and you shall see him. There shall I but see mine own reflection. <gasps> I'll tarry no longer with you. Farewell, good senior love. I am glad of your departure. Adieu, good monsieur. Melancholy. Do you hear, Forrester? Very well, what would you? I pray you, what is the clock? You should ask me what time of day. There's no clock in the forest. Then there is no true lover in the forest. Else, sighing every minute and groaning every hour would detect the lazy foot of time as well as a clock. And why not the swift foot of time? Had not that been as proper? By no means, sir. Time travels in diverse paces with diverse persons. I'll tell you who time ambles with all, who time trots with all, who time gallops with all, and who he stands still with all. I prithee, who doth he trot with all? Marry. He trots hard with a young maid between the contract of her marriage and the day to solemnize. If the interim be but a senite, time's pace is so hard that it seem the length of seven year. Who ambles time withal? With a priest that lacks Latin and a rich man that hath not the gout. For the one <laughs> sleeps easily because he cannot study, and the other lives merrily because he feels no pain. Who does he gallop withal? With thieves to the gallows, for though they go as softly as foot can fall, they think themselves too soon there. Who stays at still withal? With lawyers in the vacation, for they sleep from term to term, and they perceive not how time moves. <laughs> Where dwell you, pretty youth? With the shepherdess, my sister, in the skirts of the forest, like fringe upon a petticoat. <laughs> Are you native of this place? Uh, as the coney that dwell where she is kindled. Your accent is something finer than you could purchase in so removed a dwelling. I have been told so of many, but indeed an old religious uncle of mine taught me how to speak, who was in his youth an inland man, for you courtship too well. For there he fell in love. I have often heard him read many lectures against it, and I thank God I am not a woman <laughs> to be touched with so many giddy offences, as he hath generally taxed the whole sex with all. Can you remember any of the principal evils that he laid to the charge of women? They were none principal. They were all like one another as halfpence are. 
Each one fault seeming monstrous till his fellow faults came to match it. I prithee, recount some of them. No, I will not cast my physic but on those that are sick. There is a man that haunts the forest, abuses our young plants by carving Rosalind on their bark, hangs odes upon hawthorns, elegies on brambles, all forsooth deifying the name of Rosalind. If I could meet that fancy monger, I would give him good counsel for... He seems to have the quotidian of love upon him. I am he that is so love shaked. I pray you tell me your remedy. There are none of my uncle's marks upon you. But what were his marks? A lean cheek, which you have not. A blue eye and sunken, which you have not. An unquestionable spirit, which you have not. A beard neglected, which you have not. Though I pardon you for that, for simply your having a beard is a younger brother's revenue. Um, then your hose should be ungartered, your bonnet unbanded, your sleeve unbuttoned, your shoe untied, and everything about you demonstrating a careless desolation. But you are no such man. You are rather point device in your accoutrements as loving yourself than being the lover of any other. Fair youth, I would, I could make thee believe I love. Me believe it. Make her that you love believe it, which I warrant she is apter to do than to confess she does. But in good sooth, are you the youth that hangs the verse on the trees wherein Rosalind is so admired? I swear to thee, youth, by the white hand of Rosalind, I am that he, that unfortunate he. But are you so in love as your rhymes speak? Neither rhyme nor reason can express how much. Love is merely a madness, and I tell you deserves as well a dark house and a whip as madmen do. And the reason why they are not so punished and cured is that the lunacy is so ordinary that the whippers are in love too. <laughs> Yet, I profess curing it by counsel. Did you ever cure any so? Yes, one. And in this manner. He was to imagine me, his love, his mistress, and I set him every day to woo me, at which time would I, being but a moonish youth, grieve, be effeminate, changeable, Longing and liking, proud, fantastical, apish, shallow, inconstant, full of tears, full of smiles, for every passion something and for no passion truly anything. As boys and women are, for the most part, cattle of this colour, <laughs> would now loathe him, then like him, now entertain him, then forswear him, now weep for him, then spit at him. That I drove my suitor from a mad humour of love to a living humour of madness, which was to forswear the full stream of the world and live in a nook merely monastic. And thus I cured him. And this way will I take it upon me to wash your liver as clean as a sound sheep's heart there not be one spot of love in. I would not be cured, youth. I would cure you if you would but call me Rosalind and come to my coat every day and woo me. Now, by the faith of my love, I will. Tell me where it is. I will take you to it, if you will go. But you should tell me where in the forest you live. Will you go? With all my heart, good youth. Nay, you must call me Rosalind. Come, sister, will you go? Come in peace, good Audrey. I will fetch up thy goats, Audrey. And how, Audrey? Am I the man yet? Doth my simple feature content you? Your features, Lord warrant us what features. I am here with thee and thy goats, like the most capricious poet, honest Ovid was among the Goths. Oh, knowledge ill inhabited. Worse than Jove in a thatched house. Ah, oh, I would the gods had made thee poetical. I do not know what poetical is. Is it honest in deed and word? Is it a true thing? No, truly. For... The truest poetry is the most feigning, and lovers are given to poetry, and what they swear in poetry may be said as lovers, they do feign. Do you wish then that the gods had made me poetical? I do, truly. For thou swearest to me that thou art honest. Now, if thou wert a poet, I might have some hope that thou didst feign. Oh, would you not have me honest? But... No, truly, unless thou wert hard favoured. For honesty coupled to beauty is to have 
that honey, a sauce to sugar. Ah, uh, material fool. Well, I am not fair, and therefore I pray the gods make me honest. Truly, for to cast away honesty upon a foul wench were to put good meat into an unclean dish. I am not a wench, though I thank the gods that I am foul. Well, praise be the gods for thy foulness. <laughs> but be it as it may be, I will marry thee. And to that end, I have been with Sir Oliver Martex, the vicar of the next village. He hath promised to meet me here in this place of the forest and to couple us. Oh, I would fain see this meeting. Well, the gods give us joy. <laughs> oh, amen. Oh, here comes Sir Oliver. Uh, Sir Oliver Martex, you are very well met. Will you dispatch with us here under this tree, or uh, shall we go with you to your chapel? Is there none here to give the woman? I will not take her on gift of any man. Truly, she must be given, or the marriage is not lawful. <laughs> proceed, proceed. I will give her. Uh, good even, good master, what you call it. How, how do you do, sir? <laughs> you were very, very well met. God yield you for your last company. I am very glad to see you. Even a toy in hand. <laughs> will you be married, Motley? As the ox has his bow, sir, the horse his curb, and the falcon her bells, so man hath his desires. And as pigeons bill, so wedlock would be nibbling. And would you, being a man of your breeding, be married under a bush like a beggar? Get you to church and have a good priest who can tell you what marriage is. This fellow will but join you together as they join Wainscot, and then one of you will prove a shrunk panel and like green timber warp. Warp. I am not in the mind, but I were better to be married of him than of another, for he is not like to marry me well, and not being well married, it may be a good excuse for me hereafter to leave my wife. Uh, let me counsel thee. Come away, sweet Audrey. We must be married, or we must live in Baudry. Never talk to me, I will weep. Do, I prithee, but yet have the grace to consider that tears do not become a man. But why did he swear he would come this morning and comes not? Nay, certainly, there is no truth in him. Do you think so? Yes, I think he is not a pig purse nor a horse stealer, but for his verity and love, I do think him as concave as a covered goblet or a worm-eaten nut. Not true in love? Yes, when he is in, but I think he is not in. You've heard him swear damn right he was. Was is not is. Besides, he attends here in the forest on the Duke, your father. I met the Duke yesterday and had much question with him. He asked me of what parentage I was and I told him of as good as he, so he laughed and let me go. <sighs> But what talk we of fathers when there is such a man as Orlando? Oh, that's a brave man. He writes brave words, speaks brave verses, swears brave oaths, and breaks them bravely. Mistress and master, you have oft inquired after the shepherd who complained of love, who you saw sitting by me here on the turf, praising the proud, disdainful shepherdess that was his mistress. Well, and what of him? If you will see a pageant truly played, go hence a little, and I shall conduct you if you will mock it. Oh, come, let us remove the sight of lovers, feedeth those in love. Bring us to this sight, and you shall say, I'll prove a busy actor in their play. <laughs> Sweet Phoebe, do not scorn me. Do not, Phoebe. Say that you love me not, but say not so in bitterness. The, the common executioner, whose heart the accustomed sight of death makes hard, falls not the axe upon the humbled neck, but first begs pardon. Will you sterner be than he that dies and lives by bloody drops? I would not be thy executioner. I fly thee, for I would not injure Indeed. thee. Thou tells me there is murder in mine eye. Tis pretty sure and very probable that eyes, which are the frailest and softest things who shut their coward gaze on atomies should be called tyrants, butchers, and murderers. 
Now I do frown on thee with all my heart. And if my eyes can wound, now let them kill thee. Why now counterfeit a swoon? Why now fall down? Or if thou'st come out, oh, for shame, for shame, lie not to say my eyes are murderers. Now show the wound my eye hath made in thee. Scratch but with a pen, and there remains some scar of it. Lean but upon a rush, the cicatrice and capable and pressure thy palm some moment keeps. But now mine eyes, which I have darted thee, hurt thee not. Nor I am sure there is no force in eyes that can do hurt. Oh, dear Phoebe, if ever, as that ever may be near, you meet in some fresh cheek the power of fancy, then shall you know the wounds invisible that love's keen arrows make. But till that time come not thou near me. When that time comes, afflict me with thy mocks, pity me not, as till that time I shall not pity thee. And why, I pray you? Who might be your mother that you insult, exult, all at once over the wretched? What, though you have no beauty? As by my faith I see no more in you than without candle may go dark to bed. Must you be therefore proud and pitiless? Why? What means this? Why look you so upon me? I see no more in you than in the ordinary of nature's sail work. Odds, my little life. I think she means to tangle my eyes too. No, faith, proud mistress, hope not after it. Tis not your inky brows, your black silk hair, your bugle eyeballs, nor your cheek of cream that can entail my spirits to your worship. You foolish shepherd, wherefore do you follow her like foggy south, puffing with wind and rain? What? You are a thousand times a better a man than she a woman. Tis such fools as you that make the world full of ill-favoured children. Tis you, not her glass, that flatters her, and out of you she sees herself more proper than any of her lineaments can show her. But, mistress, know yourself, down on your knees, and thank heaven, fasting for a good man's love. For, I must tell you, friendly, in your ear, sell when you can, you are not for all markets. Cry the man a mercy, love him, take his offer. Foul is most foul, being foul to be a scoffer. So take her to thee, shepherd. Fare you well. Sweet youth, I pray you try to year together. I'd rather hear you cheer eyes than this man woo. He's fallen in love with your foulness, and she'll fall in love with my anger. If it be so, as fast as she answers thee with frowning looks, I'll sort her with bitter words. Why look you so upon me? For no ill will I bear you. Oh, I pray you do not fall in love with me, for I am falser than vows made in wine. Besides, I like you not. If you all know my house, tis at the tuft of the olives here hard by. Will you go, sister? Shepherd, ply her hard. Come, sister. Shepherdess, look on him better, and be not proud, though all the world could see, none could be so abused in sight as he. Come, will we go? Dead shepherd. Now I find thy soft light. Whoever loved that loved it not at first sight. Oh, sweet Phoebe. Uh, uh, what sayest thou, Silvius? Sweet Phoebe, pity me. Why, I am sorry for thee, gentle Silvius. Thou hast my love. Is that not neighborly? I would have you. But that were covetedness. Silvius, the time was that I hated thee, and yet it is not that I bear thee love, but since thou can talk of love so well, thy company, which erst was irksome to me, I'll endure, and I'll employ thee too, but do not look for further recompense other than thine own gladness that thou art employed. Oh, so holy and so perfect is my love, and I in such a poverty of grace that I shall think it a most plenteous crop to glean the broken ears after the man that the main harvest reaps. Loose now and then a scattered smile, and that I'll live upon. Knowest now that youth hath spoke to me a while? Well, not very well, but I have met him oft. I think not I love him, though I ask for him. Tis but a peevish boy. Yet he talks well. But what care I for words? Yet words do well when he that speaks them pleases those that hear. Tis a pretty youth, but not very pretty. But sure, he's proud. And yet his pride becomes him. He'll make a proper man. The best thing in him is his complexion. And faster than his tongue did make offense, his eye did heal it up. He is not very tall. Yet for his years he's tall. His leg is but so-so. Yet he is well. There is a pretty redness in his lip. 
a little riper and more lusty red than that mixed in his cheek. It was just the difference between the constant red and the mingled damask. Uh, there be some women, Silvius, that had they marked him in parcels as I did, would have gone as near to fall in love with him. But for my part, I love him not, nor hate him not. And yet I have more cause to hate him than to love him, for what had he to do to chide at me? He said my eyes were black, and my hair black, and now I am remembered scorned at me. I marvel at why I answered not again. But that's all one. Oh, mittens is no quittance. I'll write him a very taunting letter, and thou shalt bear it, will thou, Silvius? Phoebe, with all my heart. Oh, I'll write it straight. The matter's in my head and in my heart. I will be bitter with him and pass him short. <laughs> Go with me, Silvius. I pray thee, pretty youth, let me be better acquainted with thee. They say you are a melancholy fellow. I do love it better than laughing. Those that are an extremity of either are abominable fellows and betray themselves of every modern censure worse than drunkards. Why? Tis good to be sad and say nothing. Why then, tis good to be a post. I have neither the scholars, melancholy, which is emulation, nor the musicians, which is fantastical, nor the lawyers, which is politics nor the ladies, which is nice, nor the lovers, which is all of these. But it is a melancholy of mine own, compounded of many symbols, extracted from many objects. Indeed, the sundry's contemplation of my travels. A traveller? By my faith, you have great reason to be sad. I fear you have sold your own lands to see other men's. Then, to have seen much and to have nothing is to have rich eyes and poor hands. Yes, I have gained my experience. But your experience makes you sad. I would rather have a fool to make me merry than experience to make me sad and to travel for it, too. Good day and happiness, dear Rosalind. Nay, and God be with you, and you talk in blank verse. Farewell, Monsieur Traveller. Why? How now, Orlando? Where have you been all this while? You, a lover, and you serve me such another trick. Never come in my sight more. My fair Rosalind, I come within an hour of my promise. Break an hour's promise in love. He will not divide a minute into a thousand parts, and break but a part of the thousandth part in the minute in the affairs of love. It may be said of him that Cupid has tapped him on the shoulder, but I'll warrant him heart whole. Dear Rosalind. Nay, and you be so tardy. Come no more in my sight. I would as lief be wooed of a snail. Of a snail? I of a snail, for though he comes slowly, he carries his house on his head, a better joint, I think, than you make a woman. Besides, he brings his destiny with him. Oh, what's that? Why, horns. Virtue is no horn maker, and my Rosalind is virtuous. And I am your Rosalind. <clears throat> it uh, pleases him to call you so, but he hath a Rosalind of a better complexion than you. Come, woo me. Woo me, for now I am in a holiday humour and like enough to consent. What would you say to me now and I were your very, very Rosalind? I would kiss before I spoke. Nay, you were better speak first, and when you were graveled for lack of matter, you might take occasion to kiss. How if the kiss be denied? Then she puts you to entreaty, and there begins new matter. Who could be out being before his beloved mistress? Mary, that should you, if I were your mistress, or... I should think my honesty ranker than my wit. What, of my suit? Not out of your apparel, and yet out of your suit. And not I your Rosalind? I take some joy to say you are, because I would be talking of her. Well, in her person I say I will not have you. Then in mine own person I die. No, faith, die by attorney. The poor world is almost 6,000 years old, and in all this time there was not any man died in his own person, vida liche, in the love cause. Men have died from time to time, and worms have eaten them, but not for love. But come, now I will be a Rosalind in a more coming on disposition. Ask you what you will, and I will grant it. Then love me, Rosalind. Yes, faith will I. Fridays and Saturdays, and all. <laughs> and wilt thou have me? Aye, and twenty such. What sayest thou? Are you not good? I hope so. Why then, can one desire too much of a good thing? Come, sister, you shall be the priest and marry us. 
Give me your hand, Orlando. <laughs> what do you say, sister? Pray thee, marry us. I cannot say the words. You must start, will you, Orlando? <sighs> Go to, will you, Orlando, have to wife this Rosalind? I will. Aye, but when? Why now? As fast as she can marry us. Then you must say, I will take thee, Rosalind, for wife. I take thee, Rosalind, for wife. <laughs> I might ask you for your commission, but I do take thee, Orlando, for my husband. <laughs> There's a girl goes before the priest, but a woman's thoughts run before her actions. So do all thoughts. They are winged. Now, tell me how long you would have her once you have possessed her. Forever and a day. Say the day without the ever. No, no, Orlando. Men are April when they woo, December when they wed. Maids are May when they are maids, but the sky changes when they are wives. I will be more jealous of thee than a Barbary cock pigeon over his hens, more clamorous than a parrot against rain, more newfangled than an ape, more giddy in my desires than a monkey. I will weep for nothing like Diana in the fountain, and I will do so when you are disposed to be merry. I will laugh like a hyena, and that when thou art inclined to sleep. But will my Rosalind do so? By my life, she will do as I do. Oh, but she is wise. Well, she would not have the wit to do this. The wise are the way with her. Make the doors upon a woman's wit, and it will out at the casement. Shut that, and will out at the keyhole. Stop that, and will fly with the smoke out at the chimney. A man that had a wife with such a wit, he might say wit with her wilt. Nay, you might take that check for it till you met your wife's wit going to your neighbour's bed. And what wit could wit have to excuse that? Marry, to say she came to seek you there. You shall never take her without her answer, unless you take her without her tongue. Oh, that woman that cannot make her husband's faults their own. Let her never nurse her child herself, for she will breed it like a fool. For these two hours, Rosalind, I will leave thee. Alas, dear love, I cannot lack thee two hours. I must attend the Duke at dinner. By two o'clock, I will be with thee again. Hi. Go your ways. Go your ways. I knew what you would prove. My friends told me as such, and I thought no less. That flattering tongue of yours won me. It is but one cast away, and so come death. Uh, two o'clock is your hour? Aye, sweet Rosalind. By my troth. And in good earnest, and so God bend me, and by all pretty oaths that are not dangerous, if you break one jot of your promise, or come one minute behind your hour, I will think you the most pathetical break promise, and the most hollow lover, and the most unworthy of her that you call Rosalind, that may be chosen out of the gross band of the unfaithful. Therefore, beware my censure, and keep your promise. With no less religion than if thou wert indeed my Rosalind. So, adieu. Well, time is the great justice that examines all such offenders, and so let time try. Adieu. You have simply misused our sex in your love prate. We must have your doublet and hose plucked over your head and show the world what the bird hath done to her own nest. Oh, cuz, cuz, cuz. My pretty little cuz, if thou didst know how many fathom deep I am in love, but it cannot be sounded. My affection hath no bottom like the Bay of Portugal. Or rather, bottomless, that as fast as you pour affection in, it runs out. I'll tell the alien that I cannot be out the sight of Orlando. I'll go find a shadow and sigh till he come. And I'll sleep. If it do come to pass, that any man turn ass, leaving his wealth and ease, a stubborn will to please. Do dame, do dame, do dame, here shall it see, gross fools as he. And if he will come, come to me, <laughs> how say you now? It is not past two o'clock, and here, much Orlando. 
I warrant you, with pure love and troubled brain, he hath taken his bow and arrows and is gone forth to sleep. Look you, who comes here? My errand is to you, fair youth. My gentle Phoebe bid me give you this. I know not the contents, but as I guess by the stern brow and the waspous action which she did use as she was writing of it, it bears an angry tenor. Now pardon me, I am but as a guiltless messenger. Why, tis a boisterous and a cruel style. Will you hear the letter? Well, so please you, for I never heard it yet, yet heard too much of Phoebe's cruelty. If the scorn of your bright eye have power to raise such love in mine, a lack in me what strange effect would they work in mild aspect? Whilst you chide me, I did love. How then might your prayers move? He that brings this love to thee little knows this love in me. And by him seal up thy mind, whether that thy youth and kind, or the faithful offer take of me, and all that I can make. Or else by him my love deny, and then I'll study how to die. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, alas, poor shepherd. Do you pity him? No, he deserves no pity. Will you love this woman? What, to make thee an instrument of playful strains upon thee, not to be endured? If you be a true lover, hence, and not a word, for here comes good company. Good morrow, fair ones. Pray you, if you know, where in the purlieus of this forest stand a sheep coat fenced about with olive trees? West of this place, down in the neighbor bottom, the rank of osiers by the murmuring stream, left on your right hand, brings you to the place. <laughs> but at this hour the house doth keep itself. There's none within. If that an eye may profit by a tongue, then should I know you by description. Such garments and such years. The boy is fair, of female favor, and bestows himself like a ripe sister. The woman low, browner than her brother. Are you not the owners of the house I did inquire for? It is no boast being asked to say we are. Orlando doth commend him to you both. And to that youth he calls his Rosalind, he sends this bloody napkin. Are you he? I am. What must you understand by this? Some of my shame, if you will know of me. What man I am, and how, and why, and where this handkerchief was stained. I pray you, tell it. When last the young Orlando did part from you, he left a promise to return again within an hour. Pacing through the forest, lo, what befell, he threw his eyes aside and mark what object did present itself. Under an oak, whose boughs were mossed with age, a wretched, ragged man, o'ergrown with hair, lay sleeping on his back. About his neck, a green, and gilded snake had wreathed itself, who, with her head in nimble threats, approached the opening of his mouth, when suddenly, seeing Orlando, it unlinked itself, and with indented glides did slip away into a bush, under which bush's shade a lioness, who with udders all drawn dry, lay crouching, head down with cat-like watch, waiting for the sleeping man to stir, for tis the royal disposition of that beast to prey on nothing that doth seem as dead, this scene, Orlando did approach the man and found it was his brother, his elder brother. Oh, I have heard him speak of that same brother, and he did render him the most unnatural that lived amongst men. Well, he might so do, for well I know he was unnatural. But to Orlando, did he leave him there food to the sucked and hungry lioness? Twice he did turn his back, and purpose so. But kindness, nobler ever than revenge, Nature, stronger than his just occasion, made him give battle to the lioness who quickly fell before him, which hurtling from miserable slumber, I awakened. Are you his brother? Was you he rescued? Was you that did so oft contrive to kill him? Twas I, but tis not I. I do not shame to tell you what I was, for my conversion so sweetly tastes being the thing I am. But for the bloody napkin? By and by. When from first to last betwixt us two tears our recountment most kindly bathed, and how I came into that desert place. In brief, he took me to the gentle duke, who gave me fresh array and entertainment, committing me into my brother's love, who led me instantly into his cave, there he stripped himself. And here, upon his arm, the lioness had torn some flesh away, which all this while had bled, which now he fainted, and cried upon fainting in for Rosalind. 
In brief, I recovered him and bound up his wound, and after some small space, being strong at heart, he sent me hither, the stranger that I am, to tell this story, that you might excuse his broken promise, and to give this napkin, dyed in his blood, unto the shepherd youth, that he in sport doth call his Rosalind. How, how now? Ganymede? Cousin Ganymede! Well, many will swoon when they do look on blood. There's more in it. Ganymede, sweet Ganymede. Cousin Ganymede. Oh, look, he recovers. I would I were at home. We'll lead you thither. I pray you, will you take him by the arm? Be of good cheer, youth, you a man. You lack a man's heart. I do so. I confess it. Ah, oh, Sirrah, anybody thinks was well counterfeited. <laughs> I pray you, tell your brother how well I counterfeited. <laughs> Hey-ho. Uh, this was not counterfeit. There is too great testimony in your complexion. It was a passion of earnest. Oh, counterfeit, I assure you. Well then, be of good heart and counterfeit to be a man. <laughs> <laughs> so I do. By faith, I should have been a woman by right. <laughs> Come, you look paler and paler. Pray you, draw homewards. Good sir, go with us. That I will. For I must bear answer back and how you excuse my brother, Rosalind. I, I shall devise something, but I pray you, commend my counterfeiting to him. Will you go? He was a lover and his lass With a hay and a hoe and a hay nine and no That o'er the green corn field should pass In the springtime, the only pretty ring time When the birds do sing Hey, ring a ding We shall find a time, Entry, patience, gentle Entry. Faith, the priest was good enough for all the old gentleman saying. A most wicked Sir Oliver, Entry, a most vile Martex. But Entry, there is a youth here in the forest lays claim to you. I, I know who tis. He has no interest in me in the world. Here comes the man you mean. Mm, it is meat and drink to me to see a clown. By my troth, we that have good wits have much to answer for. We shall be flouting. We cannot hold. Good even, Audrey. God ye good even, William. And uh, good even to you too, sir. Uh, good even, gentle friend. Now, cover thy head, cover thy head. Nay, prithee, be covered. How old are thee, friend? Oh. Five and twenty, sir. A ripe age. Is your name William? Aye, sir, William. Oh, a fair name. Was born in the forest here? Aye, sir, I thank God. Thank God. A good answer. <laughs> Art rich? Well, faith, sir, so-so. So-so is good. Very good. Very excellent good. And yet it is not. It is but so-so. Aren't that wise? Well, aye, sir. I have a, uh, I have a pretty wit. Well, why thou sayest well. I do now remember a saying, the fool doth think he is wise, but the wise man knows himself to be a fool. The heathen philosopher, but when having a desire to eat a grape, would open his lips when he put it into his mouth, meaning thereby that grapes were made for eating and lips to open. You do love this maid? Oh, I do, sir. <laughs> Give me thy hand. Art thou learned? Oh, uh, no, sir. <laughs> then learn this of me. To have is to have. Ow. For it is a figure in rhetoric that drink, being poured out of a cup into a glass, by filling one doth empty the other. Now, all the writers do consent that Ipsy is he, but you are not Ipsy, for I am he. Wait, which he, sir? He, sir, that must marry this woman. Therefore, you clown, abandon, which is in the vulgar, 
leave the society which is in the boorish company of this female, which in the common is woman, which together is abandon the society of this female, or clown, thou perishest, or to thy better understanding, diest, or to wit, I kill thee, make thee away, translate thy life into death, thy liberty into bondage. I will deal in poison with thee, or in bastinado, or in steel. I will bend thee with thee in faction. I will all run thee with policy. I will kill thee a hundred and fifty ways. <laughs> Therefore, tremble and depart. Do, good William. God rest you, Mary, sir. <laughs> Our master and mistress seeks you. Come away, away! Trip, Audrey, trip, Audrey. I attend, I attend. In sweet lovers, love the spring. Is possible that in so little acquaintance you should like her? That but seeing you should love her, and loving woo, and wooing she should grant? And will you persevere to enjoy her? I love Aliena. Say with her that she loves me. Consent the both that we may enjoy each other. It shall be to your good. For my father's house and all the revenue that was old Sir Rollins will I estate upon you. And here, live and die a shepherd. You have my consent. <laughs> Let your wedding be tomorrow. Thither will I invite the Duke and all's contented followers. Go you and prepare Aliena, for look you, here comes my Rosalind. God save you, brother. And you, their sister. <laughs> oh, my dear Orlando, how it grieves me to see thy heart in a scar. It is my arm. I thought your heart had been wounded by the claws of a lion. And wounded it is, but with the eyes of a lady. Did your brother tell you how I counterfeited to swoon when he showed me your handkerchief? Aye, and greater wonders than that. Oh, I know where you are. <laughs> hey, it is true, for your brother and my sister no sooner met, but they looked. No sooner looked, but they loved. No sooner loved, but they sighed. No sooner sighed, but they asked one another the reason. No sooner knew the reason, but they sought the remedy. And in these degrees have they made a pair of stairs to marriage, which they will climb. They shall be married tomorrow, and I will bid the Duke to the nuptial. But, oh... How bitter a thing it is to look into happiness through another man's eyes. Why then, tomorrow I cannot serve your turn for Rosalind. I can live no longer by thinking. I will weary you then no longer with idle talking. Know of me then, for now I speak to some purpose, that you are a gentleman of good conceit. Believe then, if you please, that I can do strange things. I have since I was three years old, conversed with a magician, most profound in his art, and yet not damnable. If you do love Rosalind so near your heart as your gesture cries it out, when your brother marries Aliena, shall you marry her? I know into what straits of fortune she is driven, and it is not impossible for me, if it appear not inconvenient to you, that she may be set before you tomorrow, human as she is, and without any danger. Speakest thou in sober meanings? By my life, I do which I tender dearly, therefore put you in your best array, bid your friends, tomorrow you shall be married, if you will, and to Rosalind, if you shall. <laughs> Look, here comes a lover of mine and a lover of hers. Youth, you have done me much in gentleness to show the letter that I writ to you. I care not if I have. Did my study to seem despiteful and ungentle to you? You were there followed by a faithful shepherd. Look upon him, love him. He worships you. Good shepherd, tell this youth what tis to love. love. It is to be all made of sighs and tears. And so am I for Phoebe. And I for Ganymede. And I for Rosalind. And I for no woman. 
It is to be all made of faith and service, and so am I for Phoebe. And I for Ganymede. And I for Rosalind. And I for no woman. It is to be all made of fantasy, all made of passion, and all made of wishes, all adoration, duty, and observance, and so am I for Phoebe. And so am I for Ganymede. And so am I for Rosalind. And so am I for no woman. If this be so, why blame you me to love you? If this be so, why blame you me to love you? If this be so, why blame you me to love you? Who do you speak to, why blame you me to love you? To her that is not here, nor doth not hear. Pray you, no more of this, tis like the howling of Irish wolves against the moon. I would help you if I can. I would love you if I could. Tomorrow, meet me all together. I will marry you if ever I marry woman, and I'll be married tomorrow. I will satisfy you if ever I satisfied man, and you shall be married tomorrow. I will please you if what contents you pleases you, and you shall be married tomorrow. As you love Rosalind, meet. As you love Phoebe, meet. And as I love no woman, I'll meet. So, fare you well. I've left you commands. I'll not fail if I live. Nor I. Nor I. Between the acres of the Rhine. <laughs> tomorrow is a joyful day, Audrey. Tomorrow we will be married. <laughs> I do desire it with all my heart. And I hope it is no dishonest desire to desire to be a, a woman of the world. <laughs> <laughs> Come, Audrey. <laughs> Dost thou believe, Orlando, that the boy can do all this that he hath promised? Sometimes do believe, and sometimes do not, as those that fear to hope and know they fear. Patience, once more, whilst our compact is urged. You say if I bring your Rosalind, you'll bestow her on Orlando here. That would I, had I kingdoms to give with her. And you say you'll have her when I bring her. That would I, were I of all kingdoms king. You say you will marry me if I accept. That will I should I die the hour after. But if you do refuse to marry me, you'll give yourself to this most faithful shepherd. So is the bargain. You'll say you have, you'll have Phoebe if she will. Though to have her and death were both one thing. I have promised to make all these matters even. Keep your word and from hence I go to make your doubts or even. I do remember in this shepherd boy some lively touches of my daughter's favor. My lord, the first time that I ever saw him, methought he was a brother to your daughter. There is sure another flood toward, and these couples are coming to the ark. Here's a pair of very strange creatures that on all tongues are called fools. Salutations and greetings to you all. Good my lord, bid him welcome. This is the motley-minded gentleman I have so oft met in the forest. He hath been a courtier, he swears. If any man doubt that, let him put me to my purgation. I have trod a measure. I have flattered a lady. I have been politic with my friend, smooth with mine enemy. I have undone three tailors. I have been in four quarrels, and like to have fought one. And how was that tearing up? Uh, faith, we met and found the quarrel was on the seventh cause. How seventh cause? Like you this fellow, my lord. I like him very well. Don't yield you, sir. I desire you of the like. I press in here, sir, amongst the rest of the country copulatives, to swear and to forswear, according as marriage binds and blood breaks. A poor virgin, sir, an ill-favoured thing, sir, but mine own. A poor humour of mine to take that that no man else will. The rich honesty dwells like a miser, sir, in a poor house as your pearl and your foul oyster. By my faith, he is very swift and sententious. According to the fool's bolt, sir, and such dulcet diseases. But how to the seventh cause? How did you find the quarrel on the seventh cause? Upon a lie seven times removed. Oh, oh, oh. oh. <laughs> uh, bear your body more seeming, Audrey. <laughs> As thus, sir, I did dislike the cut of a certain courtier's beard. He sent me word, if I said his beard was not cut well, he was of the mind it was. 
This is called the retort courteous. If I sent him word again, it was not well cut. He would send me word, he cut it to please himself. This is called the quip modest. If again it was not well cut, he would disable my judgment. This is called the reply churlish. If again it was not well cut, he would say I spake not true. This is called the reproof valiant. If again it was not well cut, he would say I lie. This is called the counter check quarrelsome. And so to the lie circumstantial and the lie direct. <laughs> How often did you say his beard was not well cut? No, I does not give him the lie circumstantial, nor he does not give me the lie direct. And so we measured swords <laughs> and parted. Can you nominate now and order the degrees of the lie? Oh, sir, we quarrel in print. By the book, as you have books for good manners, I will name you the degrees. The first, the retort courteous. The second, the quip modest. The third, the reply churlish. The fourth, the reproof valiant. The fifth, the countercheck quarrelsome. The sixth, the lie with um, oh, circumstance. The seventh, the lie direct. Now, all of these you may avoid, except the lie direct. And you may avoid that too with an if. I knew when seven justices could not take up a quarrel, but the parties were met themselves. One of them thought, but of an if, as if you said so, then I said so. And they shook hands and swore brothers. Your if is the only peacemaker. Much virtue in if. Is not this a rare fellow, my lord? He's as good at anything and yet a fool. He uses his folly like a stalking horse, and under the presentation of that, he shoots his wits. Lord. I didn't even find clothes that thing. I'm going to tell you the whole story, please. Peace, ho, I bar confusion. Tis I must make conclusion of these most strange events. Here's eight that shall take hands and must join now in wedding bands if truth holds true content. You and I, no cross shall part. You and you are heart in heart. You to his love must accord or have a woman as your Lord. You and you are sure together as winter to foul weather. To you I give myself for I am yours. To you I give myself for I am yours. If there be truth in sight, you are my daughter. If there be truth in sight, you are my Rosalind. If sight and shape be true, why then my lover do? I'll have no father if he be not he. I'll have no husband if he be not he. Nor ne'er wed woman if he be not she. Whilst a wedlock hymn we sing, feed yourselves with questioning. Let reason wonder may diminish how thus we met and these things finish. <laughs> the carol they began that hour with the hay and a hoe and a hay nanny no. That life was but a flower in the springtime, the only pretty ring time when the birds do sing. A ring a ding ding, sweet lovers of the spring. Uh, let me have the audience for a word or two. I am the second son of old Sir Roland that brings these tidings to this fair assembly. Duke Frederick, after hearing how men every day of men of great worth resorted in this forest, addressed a mighty power, which were on foot in his own conduct, set to take his brother here and put him to the sword and, and to the skirts of this wild wood he came. Where, meeting with an old religious man after some question with him, was converted, not only from his enterprise, but from the world, his crown bequeathing to his banished brother, and all their lands restored to them again that were with him exiled. Uh, this to be true, uh, I do engage my life. Welcome, young man. 
to one his lands withheld and to the other a land itself at large a potent dukedom first in this forest let us do those ends here were well begun and well begot and after every of this happy number that have endured shrewd days and nights with us shall share the good of our returned fortune meantime forget this new fallen dignity and fall into our rustic revelry play music and you brides and bridegrooms all with measure heaped in joy to the measures fall Woo! sir by your patience if i heard you rightly the duke hath put on a religious life and thrown into neglect the pompous court. He had. To him will I. Out of these convertities, there is much to be heard and learned. To you, your former honor, I bequeath. Your patience and your virtue well deserves it. You to a love that your faith doth merit. You to land and love and great allies. You to a long and well deserved bed. And you to wrangling, for thy loving is but two months victualled. So, to your pleasures, pleasure. I am for other than dancing measures. Stay, Jakes, stay. To see no pastime, I. What you will have, I'll stay to know at your abandoned cave. Proceed. Pr proceed! We will begin these rites as we do trust they'll end in true delights. Was the love of land his last with the hay and the hoe and the hay not ago that o'er the green cold fields it pass in the springtime, the only glittering time when birds do sing. Every day. Spring. 